Hi everyone, Stepan here. It's Friday, so we are going to go through another Fisher game. Uh, we will continue the series with his first ever US Junior Championship, the first, uh, the first he ever played. He was 12 years old at the time, it was played in 1955 in Lincoln, Nebraska. And only 6 games out of 10 were saved. Uh, or at least there is no easy way to find them online. If anybody has an idea of how to get uh, rounds 5, 6, 8 and 9 of the 1955 US Juniors, I would appreciate it. Okay, so uh, he was 12, he was still very much inexperienced. His players in this US Junior Championship were, some of them were unrated. Uh, his opponent in this game, Kenneth Warner, was rated 1550. He was from Bakersfield, California, so not a high rated player. Fisher at the time uh, apparently was 1800 strength after the US Amateur Championship, but that's really the rating shouldn't really be uh, his realistic strength. Okay, so, so let's look at the first game. Uh, this game was a roller coaster. It was we sort of got a glimpse into what Fisher was about to become. And you could see that he had his tactical ability. He had his great intuition even back then, but he wasn't a developed player yet. And that's why I just love looking at these early games. I've never seen them before this because nobody shows them. And it's an incredible game. Okay, so Fisher, of course, opens with pawn to e4. Uh, yeah, by the way, I should just mention that this US Championship was won by Charles Calame. Uh, he was from Philadelphia uh, and he won with nine, uh, nine uh, wins and a loss, which is huge. Okay, and then in 57 he won the, the collegiate, uh, collegiate Championship as well. Okay, so c5 from Kenneth Warner, knight f3, knight to c6. And we have d4, d open Sicilian, after cd4, knight d4, uh, Fisher's opponent plays knight to f6. He could also, of course, play e5, going into the Kalashnikov. After knight f6, Fisher plays knight c3, and now e5 would be the Sveshnikov. Uh, he could also play e6, of course, going into different uh, Scheveningen type center uh, Sicilian positions. But his opponent plays pawn to d6, which is the classical Sicilian. And we are going to transpose into the Sicilian dragon. So for those of you who play e4, and for those of you who play the Sicilian, I think this is a very instructive point, and I would like to spend a few minutes there. So if you play against an aggressive player who has the white pieces, and against the knight or for the dragon, they play very sharp lines with bishop c4, bishop g5, and castling queenside, like the Yugoslav or the English attack then this may be a very nice move order to trick them with. Of course, there's a possibility that your opponent will play the Rosolimo, but that, then you have to know how to play against the Rosolimo. Anyway, after pawn to d6, the main move is bishop e2 in this classical Sicilian. And now by far the most popular is the Boleslavsky variation with pawn to e5, which wasn't played in the game. And this is a Nidorf without a6, in which White has already committed his bishop to, to e2, which means that moving the bishop to c4 and going for more aggressive Nidorf setups isn't really a viable option. So after knight f3, h6, this position continues in a calmer fashion. And of course, black plays for d5. Instead of that, after bishop to e2, uh, Kenneth Warner, I, I don't know if he did this intentionally, but this was actually a very interesting game, theoretically. He played the move g6, and after g6, we now have a Sicilian dragon setup, uh, where after bishop to e3, Fischer goes for the Yugoslav attack with f3, queen d2, castles, queen side. After bishop to g7, we have now transposed into the classical dragon Sicilian. And by playing this move order, black is, in a way, outsmarting white and making him play a less ambitious setup. Now that the bishop is on e2, this position is not going to be as sharp. So most Fisher games against the dragon are bishop c4, f3, queen d2, castles, queen side, checkmate. Again, Fisher Larsen, uh, 1970. Uh, and in this position, on the highest level, and this was played by many strong players, so Carlsen played this with white, Ivanchuk played this, MVL played it, Timofeyev played it, many players played this with white. Uh, the most popular way to play is, the, is to castle kingside, and then after castles king, kingside, white will usually voluntarily move the knight away to b3, 
and then continue with the move f4. And after something like rook c8, there are a couple of options. You could play for f5, you could play for e5, and very interesting position. Instead of that, Fisher probably that wasn't theory at the time, castling short here, and he was 12, so he was probably tricked out of his normal move orders. He played move f3, which is slightly slow, but still okay. Okay, black castles now, and in this position, uh, he played queen d2, and the reason why this is not good is that black now has the chance to, to achieve the dream move in the Sicilian to play d5, and he can do that without being punished. Now, normally, uh, black wouldn't be able to do that, but in this position, after queen d2, Kenneth Warner should have played d5. And the thing is, after you castle queenside in this position, because you, you don't want to take without winning a pawn, the position should be perfectly excuse me, equal after d takes e4 and f takes e4, an equal position. If, for example, after d5 you try to win the pawn, as is normally the fashion when, when black plays d5 too early and you take on c6 and they take, you simply don't have enough pieces. Two defenders, two attackers, doesn't work. Okay, instead of that, uh, after queen to d2, Fisher's opponent prevented knight b5, which isn't good. Now, Fisher castles queen side, and now his setup is perfectly justified, and it's a great setup. Still, black should have sacrificed the pawn with d5, f just to open up the center and activate his pieces. Uh, he doesn't want this bind on, bind on the position. Fisher now can win a pawn, but it comes at the cost of opening the b-file, and whether that's a smart idea or not, I don't know. So so this position, for example, cd5, queen d5, white wins a pawn, but black has all the lines are open and it's very, very tricky to play this. So of course black shouldn't trade the queens off here. Instead of that, after castles queen side, black played the move queen a5, which again is slightly too slow. Fisher defends with king b1. Rook to d8, normal Sicilian moves, and Fisher now starts just g4. He's already much better. He has everything he wants. Black didn't play b5 yet. Black didn't play bishop e6. Uh, black didn't play knight e5, knight c4. Black didn't play rook b8 and, and rook c8. So, so black is undeveloped and there's no attack. So in this position, black trades off. So knight takes, bishop takes, plays bishop e6, which fine, he didn't want to give up his bishop. He wants to threaten stuff on a2. And now Fischer goes badly wrong. Uh, in this position, he played a child's move. I mean, this is where you see that Fischer was 12, that he was a kid, that he wasn't the player that he became. When he was when he was 15 and 16, he was already a monster, like playing in the Bled Zagreb Belgrade. Four years later, he was insanely good at 16. And he, he could play with Tal and other geniuses. When he was 12... He played moves like queen e3. Now queen e3 is a very nice move threatening to win an exchange. But yeah, unfortunately it doesn't work. It could be defended against. What he should have done had he understood the importance of time in this position, which he probably did, but he thought that this was a free tempo, uh, he should have played the move h4. The problem is that queen e3 is not a free tempo because black doesn't really want the rook on the d-file, he wants the rook on the c-file anyway. And in this position, black is equal and has enough time to cause problems in the white position. So if you play h4 now, then b5 threatens to chase your knight away and simply win the a2 pawn with a lot of pressure and maybe win the game. So probably bishop f6 uh, to free up the, the d5 square and after bishop f6, knight d5. And this would have been just equal. So takes, pawn takes, or rook takes and an equal position. Uh, instead of that, Fischer's opponent uh, defended in a different way, in a bad way. He played knight to d7. The problem is, it's not that the knight is bad on d7. It's not that uh, the bishop was worse closed on g7. It's that you didn't cause enough pressure with the move rook c8, and now you're not threatening that many things. In this position, knight d7 was extremely slow, and Fisher's bluff, if it wasn't a bluff, but queen e3 sort of paid, paid off, because because he managed to improve his position for free without being punished. Now, there are two ways to go for an absolutely crushing attack, f4 or h4. Fischer chose f4, which is probably better, and you just want to play f5 and win. So now we have bishop takes d4, queen takes d4, knight back to f6, and of course f5, just break through. And this position is just, this is like plus 5 or plus 10, this is game over. Bishop d7, here he again went wrong, 
Uh, if you want, you can pause the video and find... It's, it's right to play and win. Just play a move that wins on the spot. Okay, in the game Fischer played h4, which is not bad, but g5 was just game over. Uh, you basically, basically, you have to play knight h5 or knight e8. Both are just dreadful. After knight h5, you just take bishop h5, g h5, and of course g6 is coming. But h4 was still okay. Bishop b5 uh, trying to trade off some pieces. Bishop f3 correctly declining the trade and making b6 and b5 less appealing because e5 would win the exchange. Rook ac8 gets rid of that. Very good move. And now Fischer made another mistake. This one is more... Uh, well, it's more strategic in nature. In a way, you, you are playing into your opponent's hands with Fischer's next move. So he took the bishop and black, of course, took with the pawn opening up the A-file, which really isn't a good idea. You allow him pressure. Instead of that, he should have just played knight, uh, knight d5. And you either trade off one of the defenders or you take on e7 or, or you manage to, after knight d5, e d5, to open some more lines and prevent d6. And this would have been much, much better. In fact, winning. But okay, knight b5, a b5, and now h5. Again, an imprecise move. F, uh, fg6, hg6, and now h5 uh, was better, giving him, uh, giving black less, less options, but okay, h5. The thing is, uh, if black plays g5 in this position, then of course the position is closed. If he plays it in the other position, then you have the diagonal open, the b1, h7 diagonal. So okay, rook c4 attacks the queen, queen e3, fine. Uh, rook a8, now he, here you see the problem with knight takes b5, a3, and now queen a4, uh, and here Fischer is still not winning, but completely winning. He of course has a huge attack, and he just needs to defend c2, so playing rook h2, playing rook d2, playing rook c1, uh, queen c1, all perfectly fine moves. Instead he played c3, and black could have won the game on the spot with queen b3. And now there's just no defense. If you try to defend with king a1, then I take on a3 with the rook and eventually win the game. So for example, rook a3, b a3, queen a3, king b1, queen b3, king c1, rook c3, win your queen, game over. If after queen b3 you try something like rook d4, then again rook a3, because it's pinned. So queen b3 was crushing. Instead, black didn't use his opportunity to do that. He blundered with knight e4. But of course, he's a 1500 player, so... You cannot expect perfect play. Bishop takes e4, rook takes e4, of course, queen to h6. And in this position, queen to d2 was better, keeping everything defended, keeping the queen close to the king. And now rook e2 played, uh, threatening mate after queen b3. So rook d2, offering the queen trade. And here, after rook d2, black to play and win. Pause the video, why is rook d2 a losing blunder? Fischer, Fischer resigned on the next move. Okay, of course, when you have unprotected pieces, then look for look for forks. So in this position, rook d2, queen d2, excuse me, queen d2 and queen e4 check and Fischer resigned. So a game which he should have won easily, he was just crushing it and unfortunately he didn't convert. So I think the critical point is this one. So you have a completely winning position, black's pieces are out of play, you have the g and the h files to work with and just g5 is a pattern, I think this is a very instructive pattern, forcing a piece, forcing the last defender out of play was much better than continuing with h4. So it was the time to, to cash in without bringing in more reserves and he didn't recognize it. So Fischer's first round in the US juniors in 1955 was a defeat, but I think still a very instructive game and especially for, for Fischer's style, I think you can see it in the game. But it's not, it's sort of unpolished. He was still, yeah, he still needed some time. Okay, but as, as the weeks go by, as we go through more Fisher games, the quality will increase and it will increase rapidly. Uh, thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope you liked Fisher's second official tournament game. Uh, we are going to continue next Friday and stay tuned for more chess. Bye bye.